Uh, this event is part of our uh, new project on the future of the EU27, which is a project that the Institute is running with the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, and the idea is to kind of do long-term research and discussions over Ireland's future within the EU. Um, so the reason that the YPN will be involved in this is obvious that obviously people here are the future of, of Ireland and the EU and we want to get people's perspectives. Uh, so we're going to start with Lucinda Creighton who's going to give an introduction of kind of her, her views on, on, on Europe and Ireland's position. Um, and then afterwards we're going to open it up to a general discussion. So you feel free to ask a question, um, but also uh, we want to hear your views and your opinions uh, on what you think the future of the EU sh should be or will be, and also uh, how Ireland needs to position itself um, in that. So I'm sure everybody knows uh, who Lucinda Creighton is. She's a former TD and Minister for European Affairs. And um, during that time, it was a very important time for Ireland uh, within the EU and negotiating the EU IMF bailout, um, and also during the presidency of the, uh, Ireland's presidency of the Council. Uh, so a very important time. And now she uh, has recently set up Vulcan Consulting, um, which is an EU affairs consultancy. So there's, there's very, very few people in Ireland who are as well positioned to talk about this topic um, as her. So we're very happy to have you here today. So Thank you so much. Yours. Okay, well, um, I suppose I, I might just give a few uh, of my own views and, uh, and then I really would be very interested to have a, have a good and hopefully a deep engagement. Um, um, and maybe some of what I will say might provoke some of that, um, uh, or indeed you might um, give me something to think about, which would be very welcome. Um, so I suppose I should nail my colours to the mast at the outset. I, um, I am a committed uh, European. Um, I am very passionately uh, in favour of and a believer in Ireland's place at the heart of Europe. Um, um, that's not to say that I you know, don't critically engage with the European debate, that I think everything is perfect, it's far from it. Um, but I think it's a really important starting point. And, you know, I come to that point of view, I hope, in an informed fashion, because I have seen and I have been involved in the European decision-making process, and I'm also a student of history, and I believe that it has been a massive, a massively important force um, across the continent from the point of view of peace, prosperity, um, and, and, and obviously from Ireland's own national perspective uh, has been hugely important in contributing to both social and economic development in, in this state. Um, and so, and I suppose, part, I hope part of that view is vindicated by the fact that Ireland is consistently uh, in Eurobarometer polls and indeed in polls carried out uh, domestically here by the European movement and others, um, the most pro-European country. Our citizens are most in favour of membership of the European Union uh, and uh, I think that that's a reflection of, of what a success it has been from our point of view. Um, but I suppose there, you know, we live in turbulent times and, uh, and this is a timely exercise, I guess, um, in, in that we are faced with a huge conundrum in the European Union, and no, for, for, no more so than from an Irish perspective because of Brexit, because it impacts on us far more profoundly than any other EU member state. But it also impacts on the overall direction of the Union, um, obviously because the UK has had a particular influence um, on the European project over the last 43 uh, year, 44 years since it joined, uh, some of it positive and some of it not, um, uh, but things are going to change um, very profoundly when the UK leaves and that uh, will impact all of Europe, not just Ireland, obviously. Um, and I suppose, I mean, my observation as somebody, I was involved in the Convention on the Future of Europe, which led to the Constitutional Treaty, so I was selected by the Irish government um, through the National Youth Forum uh, when I was in Young Flagel to, to, to participate in the Youth Convention. Um, along with a guy called Leo Bradker, I don't know if any of you have heard of him, um, and, and Averill Power, um, who was, a, who was uh, in Fianna Fáil at the time, and, uh, and a number of others. Um, and at that time, you know, this was obviously the debate. It was the future of Europe, it was how does the European Union move ahead. And a lot of the big ideas contained in that um, ended up in the Constitution, rejected by France and the Netherlands and a couple of others, ended up becoming uh, the Lisbon Treaty, 
uh, rejected by Ireland, but then subsequently we changed our mind. Um, and you know, obviously there were cha- there were there were developments in the European project, um, but not quite as ambitious as had originally been intended uh, after the conclusion of the convention. So it's funny we're back having you know essentially the same debate again, um, uh, whatever it is, fifteen years later. Um, and I think through throughout the last fifteen years, um, you know, we've obviously we've been through existential crisis. We've been through major, major challenges. Um, you know, which begged the question at different stages: Would the European Union survive? Would the eurozone survive? Um, you know, was the whole thing just going to implode? And a lot of people hoped, hoped, and believed it would, um, and it didn't. And not because the European Union necessarily handled a lot of those crises as well as it could or should, um, but I think because of a, a common belief across across the Union um, that we needed it to survive and we wanted it to, sur- to survive. Um, and uh, I think, you know, given that we've been through what we've been through since 2008, um, I'm actually quite confident and, and optimistic about the future of the European project because I think if we could survive um, the Euro crisis, we can pretty much survive anything um, because it was so profound and so so existential. And what it has done is it has highlighted um, the need for deeper and closer cooperation at European level. Um, and, you know, it's funny because particularly since Emmanuel Macron set out his vision for the future of Europe, slightly watered down, I think, from what was leaked in advance, but still a pretty bold amb- ambition for Europe, most of which I would, ag- or a lot of which I would agree with. Um, the reaction in Ireland has been predictable. It has been defensive. It has been, let's close our ears to this, we don't really want to talk about it. It has been um, largely negative. And that is extraordinary, considering we are the most pro-European citizens in the European Union. Um, and I'm getting a bit tired of it, I suppose. I'm getting a bit tired of the debate in this country around Europe, which tends to centre on two things. One is we don't want tax harmonisation, so we want, you know, we want to exercise vetoes, we want to say no to that, and we want to block things. Uh, and on the other hand, we want, and this debate will start very soon, through the multi-annual financial framework process, the budgetary process, we want more money. We want money for farmers. We want money for for roads. We want money for we you know we want transfers basically, and I think that's a very reductive kind of approach. Um, I don't think it's going to be sustainable um, for much longer, and I think it really doesn't do us much of a service. I think it undersells our potential and our capacity as Irish, Irish citizens and European citizens and as a member state of the European Union. So I think we need to start reassessing and reevaluating and having a different conversation. Well, what I would like to see, and this is obviously a really important part of the process now, this project through the IIEA and the Department of Foreign Affairs, is a real engagement on what we actually want to see um, in, in the future composition of the European Union. Um, I don't think we can set out a whole set of sort of ambitions and expect them to happen or accept, expect to reach agreement at EU level overnight. The nature of the European project is incremental. It has to be because of the diversity of opinion and the composition of it and the size of it. Um, but we have to, we as a country uh, within the EU have to start setting out a view on, on where we want it to go. Um, and, you know, I know it's a bit of a cliche, um, a phrase which Jean-Claude Juncker, I think, ran his campaign on a couple of years ago and has reiterated, and has kind of been the mantra of the European Commission in recent years, which is we need to do the big things uh, better, um, we need to do them more closely together, and we need to we, we need to do less of the little things. In other words, the sorts of things that niggle people and annoy people, bureaucracy, red tape, straight bananas, bendy bananas, whatever, less of that stuff and more of the security and defence cooperation, more of the big ambitious ideas around, you know, environment, climate change, those sorts of things. And I think there's something in that actually. Um, I mean it is the the very point of federalism. I'm a federalist. People use federalism as though it's a bad word. Federalism, to me, is the ideal in democracy because it means subsidiarity. It means that you, you know, you you keep decision making as close to the people as you can. So you do as much at local level, as much at, at regional level, as much at national level, and then um, and then as much at um, European level as is necessary. Uh, and we've never really come to terms with that. We've never really grasped it. Um, but I think that that is the right approach. 
Uh, and I think it's the, the approach that we need to we need to need, we, we need to not just push, but we need to spell out and articulate a little bit more clearly um, through this debate. Um, so I suppose from from Ireland's point of view, I mean it's not for me. I'm I'm just one citizen uh, to sort of determine what our vision of Europe should be. But we need to start having a national conversation about it pretty quickly. Um, I think for me, one example. Um, of an area where we definitely need much deeper and much closer cooperation is in economic cooperation. You can't run a monetary union uh, without closer cooperation on fiscal issues. Um, and we learned that through the financial crisis. We saw how the Stability and Growth Pact was abused by many member states, and particularly the large ones. Um, that contributed to uh, significant challenges um, throughout the, the course of the last 10 years. Um, we, you know, we've seen really ineffectual management of public finances in a range of member states, including our own. Um, and we have seen the disadvantage that peripheral, peripheral countries um, um, uh, have to live by. Um, and we have to find a way to address that. It's not going to be feasible or credible to continue sort of trundling along as we have done. There will definitely need to be much greater and um, uh, uh, much more coordinated drive toward banking union uh, and closer economic cooperation uh, if if the, the, the currency is to thrive and if it is to benefit all of us as citizens of the union. So in that sense, I agree with Emmanuel Macron. Um, I don't believe that that necessarily has to mean tax harmonisation. I think it does mean we need um, some form of budget at Eurozone level, some sort of a fund. Um, we have the ESM, but it's a crisis fund but a fund that can actually be used uh, in a more practical way. Um, and, uh, and we need to start building towards that now. We need to have a better way, uh, a better way of dealing with future banking crises. Um, and we need to have um, a mechanism to sustain our currency into the future for the benefit of all of, all of the member states and all of our citizens. Um, and that's a debate that we don't really like to have in this country, but it's one that I think we need to have. Um, likewise, when it comes to security and defence issues. Um, Macron's speech was interesting because he's, you know, he's talking about the need to be able to mobilise troops in a crisis, but actually we have that capacity. We have battle, EU battle groups, um, which were signed up to. Um, uh, it kind of makes a bit of a joke of our so-called neutrality. Um, I know we talk about it virtuously all the time, but we're not really neutral. Um, I think we proved in our support for intervention in Kosovo, um, what was it, 25 years ago, um, that we're not, we're not really, um, we're not, or 20 years ago, we're not, we're not really neutral in this country. Um, we like it because it makes us feel good about ourselves. We like to talk about it and talk down to others about it, but. But in reality, we, we need common security and defence in, in Europe. We benefit from it, and we probably should be contributing to it. Um, so there is, there is a lot of work to do around that. In areas like practical areas, like counter-terrorism, counter which is an area that I do a lot of work in at the moment, um, you know, we are hugely exposed in Ireland, um, and we don't really have a full understanding of that, because we don't really share um, intelligence, we don't, we're don't. we not really, our police force is not really interoperable with others across the Union, um, and we need to address those deficiencies and shortcomings. These are sensitive questions of so-called sovereignty, obviously, but if we're to protect our citizens, the best way we can do that, the most effective way we can do that, is by cooperating with other uh, EU member states. So they're the kind of big issues that we need to be cooperating on. Um, and uh, there are issues where you know there will always be controversy. There will always be um, you know inflammatory uh, rhetoric. Um, but I think we need to actually engage with those debates and uh, and work on them. Um, and uh, you know I I've been I've been involved in a lot of debates recently. Um, with, it's funny, there's, well obviously there's one political party on this island that has opposed every single ref EU referendum since 1972, um, which is now pro-European because it suits their political purposes in Northern Ireland. Um, and they now say, well we like Europe but we don't really like the Europe that we have because we want a social Europe um, and it's, this is a kind of a neocon Europe that we're living in. Um, I mean, I... I just find that funny, and I think it's a debate that, or it's a, it's a, it's a line that we really have to challenge because, um, you know, there is no continent on the globe, there is nowhere in the world 
with the sort of social protections and social transfers that we benefit from in Europe. Um, you know, if you look at Africa, if you look at the United States, if you look at Asia, there is nowhere as social <coughs> as Europe. Um, and uh, and this, this, this sort of rhetoric and this sloganeering that we are subjected to on a constant basis by people who I think just lack any sort of imagination in terms of a, a political argument to put forward really needs to be challenged because, um, because we do have a social model in Europe. Obviously there's, there's diversity across different member states, there's different approaches, um, but, but overall the protections, the guarantees and the rights that our citizens enjoy are stronger than any other part of the world. That's not to say they can't be improved, they can, um, but, um, but I think you know, the point always has to be made that you have to have economic growth and you have to have wealth in order, in order to be able to provide those sort of social um, safety nets and protections that, that we want um, in all of our societies. Um, and that is, I mean, there is definitely a debate to be had around that in terms of levels of particularly youth unemployment. Um, I mean, obviously it's declining across, um, across the European Union. There have been really positive um, uh, indicators over the, lo the last year in particular. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do on that. And there's an awful challenge, as our, in an, a significant challenge as well, in terms of just communicating the benefits of the European Union, uh, which, um, unfortunately, the institutions are absolutely diabol diabolical at doing, and member states don't bother doing it because it's not really in their interest to do it, because they much rather... Member state governments, I mean, they're, they're much more interested in claiming credit uh, for anything positive that happens themselves rather than um, attributing it to to our membership of the European Union, except, of course, when there's a referendum to be passed in them.